This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Oil Spills. Do you wish the ocean were black? Spill some oil today! Welcome to episode 79 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. Today, we are talking about carbon, the thing that makes up mechanical pencils, the fizzy stuff in Mountain Dew, and the diamond in the ring you gave your girlfriend to tell her you want to spend the rest of your life with her. Seriously, who decided that if you solidify soda fizz into something shiny, that it's a sign of everlasting love? Like, Diamonds are cool, but I'd prefer the soda, to be honest with you. Specifically, we'll be talking about carbon capture. Carbon capture is a lot like it sounds. Luring the carbon into a van, putting a paper bag over its head, and shouting at it until it stops contributing to climate change. Well, something like that. But the concept of carbon capture has garnered a lot of interest and innovation due to its potential as a climate solution. Even Elon Musk has funded a $100 million prize for carbon capture technology. Our goal is like basically to have it be sort of interesting, fun, and, and ultimately useful, and to spur creative ideas for what is actually the smartest way to take the trillions of tons of carbon that we, we've removed from the ground, and will remove from the ground, mm -hmm. from deep, deep underground, and we've placed that carbon in the atmosphere and oceans, which obviously changes the, the chemical constituency of the surface of the Earth. I know Elon Musk is polarizing, and in all fairness, it's not like carbon capture is Elon Musk's baby. If it were his baby, we'd probably have to call it XAE312 ampersand asterisk asterisk upside down smile emoji O with an umlaut baby carrot or something. But in any case, when a billionaire gets excited about a technology and is already setting goals and putting up money to spur innovation, it's worth taking a look to see if there's something there. In the case of carbon capture, there very well could be. Most likely not in the sense of, let's ignore clean energy and just do this. Clean energy is a lot cheaper than carbon capture, as we discussed last week among other advantages. But when we talk about a zero-carbon future, and we consider that last 5 or 10% of emissions that are really hard to deal with, it's good to know that we have the option of capturing carbon too. Best case scenario, we could even be carbon negative someday and cool the climate back to its original state. So there's a lot for Elon and other billionaires to be excited about, and that's what we're going to explore today what carbon capture techniques exist, what some hurdles might be, and how they could be overcome. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. This story has been supported by the Solutions Journalism Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to rigorous and compelling reporting about responses to social problems. Learn more at Solutions Journalism. Org. If you want to take two minutes to help out the Sweaty Penguin, you can either leave us a five-star rating and review, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Sweaty Penguin. Doing either earns you a special shout-out at the end of the show. Joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and a whole lot more. First, it's time for Carbon Capture 101. <laughs> As a reminder, carbon dioxide is a gas that we emit when we burn fossil fuels, and when it is released into the atmosphere, it absorbs solar radiation and warms the planet. Having some carbon in the atmosphere is fine, but much like hair in your pasta, some is fine but too much and you have a problem. Currently, we're continuing to emit more and more, causing further climate change and creating an atmosphere equivalent to a bowl of angel hair and actual hair. Stop emitting carbon is obviously the logical fix, especially when Mother Nature says no takebacks, but it's not quite that simple. For one, we've already emitted a lot of carbon. 
If we want to return the climate to normal, we'd likely want to address that. Two, carbon emissions aren't just vanishing today. They're not the coin behind your ear. Or, wait, is that a coin in my pocket? They're still rising in some countries, but emissions have come down 12% in the U.S. since their peak in 2007. To meet internationally stated climate goals, we'd have to pick up the pace considerably, and I'm optimistic we will. But that still means we will emit carbon over the next few decades. And on top of that, there are some sources of industrial emissions that are really hard to eliminate, such as aviation, long-haul shipping, cement, iron, and steel. That's not to say they can't improve, but carbon capture can be an option if some of these emission sources can't get all the way to zero. As we'll see today, carbon capture just isn't equipped to take on the whole of climate change, but you can see how it could play a helpful role if used in the right way. So how exactly do we capture carbon? Over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you 10 ways. Honestly, each one of these 10 ways could be its own episode, so I'll just give a quick summary of how each one works, some pros, and some challenges. Ready? Let's dive in. 1. Scrubbing. This is the first of three that we call point source capture, where carbon is captured at the site of emissions, be it a power plant, a chemical plant, what have you. To perform scrubbing, you don't need a sponge or one of those brushes that always squirts the soap in the wrong direction. You actually create a scrubbing tower, and you let the emissions from the plant into the tower. These emissions are called flue gas, I assume because it gives the earth a fever. Flue gas is maybe 5 to 15% CO2. Then you introduce a solvent, which would typically be a weak base. CO2 is a weak acid, so the solvent reacts with the acid and separates the CO2 from the rest of the flue gas. That then goes into another tower, where the CO2 is peeled from the solvent, the solvent is recycled, and the CO2 is captured. There's other ways to accomplish scrubbing, but this method is really the main one. It's called adsorption. Not to be confused with what we do every time we watch the Super Bowl. Seriously, why do I have to remember every ad? There's a game on, the ads are when I get my snacks! Scrubbing is the most widely used industrial carbon capture technique, and it makes sense. It's a lot cheaper to target flue gas, which has a high concentration of carbon already, and it's just a retrofit that can be added to pretty much any facility. But it still costs money without providing revenue, and as we'll see, that 5-15% to CO2 concentration can actually be improved upon with some of the other techniques. 2. Oxyfuel Combustion I promise, we're going through the brutal chemistry ones first. Not all 10 of these sound like the answer you got wrong on a high school chemistry pop quiz that ultimately ruined your GPA just enough to get you deferred from your dream college. Alright, so basically, when you burn fossil fuels, there's a combustion reaction that happens with the carbon in the fuel and the oxygen in the air. The two meet, and they produce energy, and CO2. Sounds like a solid pitch for a Netflix reality show, like Love is Blind meets Breaking Bad. So in a power plant, or even your car engine, you're sucking in air to perform this combustion reaction. But air is only 21% oxygen. It's mostly nitrogen with a tinge of BO. And that flue gas ends up having a lot of nitrogen in it as a result. So with oxyfuel combustion, rather than sucking in air, you first turn the air into pure oxygen, and then put the pure oxygen in with the fuel. That's a purer form of the combustion reaction, and it results in a flue gas with a much higher concentration of CO2. You then use scrubbing to get rid of that, but it's a lot easier now. 
The drawback is that you can't retrofit an existing facility to be able to do oxyfuel combustion. You have to plan it that way from the get-go. It's also a very new technology and likely needs time to develop. 3. Pre-Combustion Capture I won't get into the details because I had trouble understanding it myself. In scrubbing or oxyfuel, the combustion reaction is with carbon. For this, we actually separate the carbon from the fossil fuel before the combustion reaction happens. So it is not carbon and oxygen reacting, but actually hydrogen and oxygen reacting. This reaction creates energy and water rather than energy and CO2. Sounds like a good season two plot twist to our Netflix reality show. So with pre-combustion, you don't have to scrub carbon at the end because there are no carbon emissions to begin with. Pre-combustion technology has also proven to typically be the most cost-efficient of these methods. But again, pre-combustion plants need to be planned that way from the start. It isn't an easy retrofit like scrubbing. And I don't know that building new fossil fuel plants in the name of climate change makes a whole lot of sense. Four, direct air capture. Essentially, rather than going to a power plant or chemical plant or something, you can put this technology anywhere and capture carbon out of thin air. This happens by either passing the air through a liquid chemical solution, which removes the carbon, or by filtering the air through heated filters under a vacuum. This technology is not deployed on a wide scale yet, but you can bet Dyson has its eye on this tech. You've heard of Dyson 3-in-1 Cyclone, but imagine if you could vacuum your floor while also vacuuming carbon out of the atmosphere. Beat that, Roomba! Considering that power plants can largely be replaced by cleaner energy sources someday, you can see how direct air capture could be a long-term strategy in a way the first three ideas can't. That said, remember how flue gas is 5-15% to 15 CO2? Regular air is about 0.042% CO2. And remember, that's with our greenhouse gas emissions. Pre-industrial times, it was about 0.028% CO2. So you can see how capturing carbon out of thin air is really like finding a needle in a haystack, minus the drugs part. You have to be sucking ridiculous amounts of air into the machine just to make a tiny dent, and that takes a lot of energy. According to Elizabeth Yampierre, executive director of Uprose, that energy use can have consequences. I'd like to say that the technology is unproven, ineffective, and inefficient. You know, when we're talking about direct air capture, we're talking about an enormous energy consumption. The huge land area that is required to operate at scale of renewables of power. And even the emissions are sort of, you know, what we call in the climate justice movement, false solutions. And false solutions is a strong word from Elizabeth. That's up there with fake news. But she does raise an important question. If we're building machines to suck in all this air to find needles in a haystack, that takes a lot of energy. It's expected to be 2.5 to 4 times that of point source capture technologies. Proponents of direct air capture will say sure, but we'd power them with clean energy, so it's still a net positive. And that's a fair argument too. But today, when we still use fossil fuels a lot more than clean energy, is it worth putting a ridiculous amount of wind turbines and solar panels into brand new direct air capture facilities when they could be replacing fossil fuels on our electric grid? Are these ridiculously inefficient machines really the best use for new solar and wind? I think lots of people would say no, and it seems like that's where Elizabeth's concern stems from. Now, there may be a day in the not-too-distant future where we have extra wind, extra solar, and we can say, here's a perfect thing to do with it. But right now, the argument is a little bleak. 
So I think unproven and ineffective might be too strong. It could be effective one day, and just because something is unproven doesn't mean it can't be proven. Otherwise, they never could have proven the greatness of the Carl's Jr. Strawberry Pop-Tart Ice Cream Sandwich. But when Elizabeth says inefficient, she's absolutely right. 5. Trees Yeah, trees absorb carbon dioxide. That's like the thing they're known for. Well, that and giving terrible advice to the boy in the giving tree. Seriously, tell the dude to just take some apples or use the seeds to plant more trees. What are you doing? I know you've all heard about planting trees and how great that is, and it's true. Trees are effective at absorbing and storing carbon. But even this idea has issues. To capture a million tons of CO2 with trees, you'd need 213,000 acres of forest, about the size of New York City. With direct air capture, best case scenario, you'd only need 100 acres, or a small 18-hole golf course. That's a massive disparity in land efficiency. And beyond that, how do you ensure these trees never get cut down or burned in a wildfire? And where are you going to put these trees? If land was previously deforested, there's probably a home there, a farm, or an ace hardware. I know trees sound like the fun and chemistry-free way to go, but it's kind of a logistical nightmare of its own. That said, on the pieces of land where tree planting is viable, it's certainly an exciting option. 6. Bioenergy with Carbon Capture and Storage, or BEX. Not to be confused with Bex from Ted Lasso, although I guess both are pretty disconcerting once you get into the details. Bex basically combines scrubbing and trees. You plant trees, cut them down, burn them at a power plant for energy, and scrub the carbon. So at the end of the process, you've taken carbon out of the air and stored it away. This removes the pressure of these trees can never get cut down, but again, it requires a massive amount of land, which is why it's more likely that Bex would rely on cutting down existing forests and replanting there rather than allocating brand new land to this. Obviously, that would damage ecosystems, intrude on whoever lives there, and create a lot more problems. Are we sure this isn't Bex from Ted Lasso? 7. Algae. Here's Arizona State University's Dr. Klaus Lochner breaking this one down. So we collect the CO2 from the air and feed it to the algae, and then you can make biofuels out of the algae. Why do we need this material? Don't trees absorb CO2 from the air? Why not just plant more trees? Because if you just grow as much as we have, nothing much changes. You end up needing more agricultural land than we have right now in use in order to make this happen. We collect CO2 roughly a thousand times as fast as a real tree. Algae, like trees, uses carbon dioxide to photosynthesize, and the result is the creation of more algae. So it is self-replicating when it takes in CO2. Who knew algae would invent cloning before humans? I mean, if stormtroopers can do it, you'd think we could. Algae is actually more efficient at sequestering carbon than trees, because it can grow faster and cover more surface area, and Dr. Lochner is working on technology to harness this process for carbon capture. But algae hasn't always been perfect either. Using algae as biofuel, as Dr. Lochner suggests, is a very new idea, and at the moment is very costly. We could also make food and drinks out of it, or even potentially make a new type of plastic out of it. Algae Tupperware sounds right up Ariel's alley. But who knows if that's scalable either. Algae is also really difficult to manage. In 2012, an American entrepreneur named Russ George essentially conned an indigenous community near British Columbia into sponsoring a project where he would add iron to the ocean, which would create an algal bloom and provide food for the salmon, claiming that would restore their dwindling harvests. 
This act did nothing for the salmon harvest, Russ George was accused of breaking multiple laws, and the algae ended up dying and yielding its carbon back to the sea, which essentially defeated the purpose. Now, Dr. Lochner is about a million times more well-researched and organized than that project, I can promise you that. But it goes to show how difficult algae is to manage, especially when algal blooms can cause major disruptions to marine ecosystems. For examples of algae gone wrong, see our seagrass episode or my fish tank. 8. Blue Carbon Projects Speaking of seagrass, we have seagrass, mangroves, reefs, and more coastal ecosystems that are extremely effective at carbon capture. The carbon they capture is called blue carbon, because it's underwater, not because it's sad. We've covered these topics before, so I won't get too into the weeds, but we can plant more seagrass or more mangroves. It gets tricky though, because coastal land is really valuable. People love lying in a bunch of sand and not being able to get it out of their shoes for three days apparently. And even though these ecosystems provide massive economic benefits, they're not always obvious in a free market. 9. Regenerative Agriculture Soil is actually a major carbon sink, and in the last 12,000 years, agricultural practices have resulted in a cumulative loss of about 133 billion tons of soil organic carbon. It did give us food for 12,000 years though, so call it even, I guess? As such, there's plenty of capacity to put some carbon back. Probably not all of it, but farmers can implement strategies, such as no-till practices, grazing management, crop rotations, cover crops, etc., which lead the soil to recapture some carbon. Some of these practices are economical for farmers in addition to climate-friendly, but not all of them, and that's where this one gets a little tricky. 10. Enhanced Weathering you know we had to finish where we started with some chemistry. It's not a sweaty penguin episode without reliving some high school science trauma. Rain is slightly acidic, and that's because it brings with it some atmospheric carbon. When it hits a rock, the acidic rain will slightly weather it. It'll say something like, you're smarter than you look, or that outfit is so retro. After the rock is weathered by this, the exposed rock will react with the carbon to form bicarbonate. The bicarbonate runs off into the ocean and gets stored away in the ocean floor. Natural rock weathering absorbs about 0.3% of fossil fuel emissions today. If we want to ramp that up, Scientists suggest turning these rocks into a powder and spreading it all over the place, basically ramping up this process on a super wide scale. And it could be effective, but critics have pointed out that it may have unintended consequences for marine ecosystems and be a logistical nightmare to accomplish among many other hurdles. So 10 strategies, I'm guessing longer than 10 minutes, but hopefully you're still with me. And as you can see, it's like the menu at IHOP. Lots of options, nothing that's perfect. Each strategy has hurdles that can be overcome. Some have more inherent roadblocks than others. To that end, now that you know how carbon capture works, I want to quickly explore a few more issues that carbon capture as a whole would have to address if it were to scale up and be successful. First off, these projects cost money. Even if it's in the cute let's plant trees on TikTok way, someone's gotta pay for it, and you know it won't be the TikTok creator fund. And what makes the money part tricky is with the exception of Bex where you're creating new fuel, or algae Tupperware where there's a product, carbon capture isn't generating revenue. It's an economic good in that it staves off the costs of climate change, but that's not reflected in the market. Carbon capture's promise is also often not kept in perspective. For example, the fossil fuel industry has actually been a major advocate for carbon capture. Just listen to Andy Lane, BP's Vice President of Carbon Capture Usage and Storage. On behalf of the industry, if I could speak in that way, 
you know, we'll be fully supportive of the key messages in the report. I think rapid deployment at scale is absolutely what's required for CCS, both in the UK uh, and in the rest of the world, as the whole uh, of the globe starts moving towards net zero in a, in a more aggressive way. First off, who knew people speak on behalf of the fossil fuel industry? That's like the second worst industry to speak on behalf of. The first, of course, being environmental comedy podcasters. But I'll do it if I have to. Now, if BP is excited about climate change and climate solutions, that's fantastic. That's really good if people find common ground on climate. But if you look deeper and you see that BP isn't trying to transition away from fossil fuels or otherwise position themselves in a low-carbon world, it starts to feel like they want carbon capture to be used in place of a transition to clean energy, not a supplement to it. Think about last week when we talked about solar power. Think back to last fall even when we talked about nuclear. I'm sure we'll talk about wind and other clean energy soon too. If you compare the hurdles in those episodes to the hurdles for each of these 10 carbon capture technologies, ultimately you can make the decision. But I think the carbon capture hurdles outweigh like 95% of the clean energy ones. Clean energy can be cheap, can be renewable, can be efficient. It, unlike carbon capture, is a product that can create businesses and spur a profit. If you're BP, you'd probably make more money off a wind farm than a direct air capture plant. So sure, if you want to take all that into account, and you still want to see rapid deployment of carbon capture... That's totally fine, but it's really difficult to envision carbon capture being a silver bullet solution. It's a great tool to have, but not the be-all and end-all. There's also the question of where to put the carbon you capture. Do we hold it in Guantanamo Bay? Do we set the molecules up at tables and let them mingle and get to know each other? Get it? Like, carbon dating? No good? Well, worth a shot. There is some interesting actual innovation going on in this area, though, with companies using the CO2 captured to create food and drinks like air protein and air vodka. That's right, you thought wine out of water was cool? Try vodka out of air. Now that's a business. However, most of the captured carbon is buried underground in deep geologic formations never to be seen again. Maybe on Discord once in a while, but that's it. Now, I know what you're thinking. That sounds unsafe. What if it leaks out? Unfortunately, a wide body of scientific evidence puts those concerns to rest. This deep geologic storage is safe and effective. That said, one way we put CO2 underground is a process that is called enhanced oil recovery, which uses the CO2 to pump the oil to the surface, and then the CO2 remains in the ground. And if carbon capture technology actually makes it easier to drill for fossil fuels, that's a little counterintuitive when you're trying to help the climate. And of course, it's worth considering that the power plants and chemical plants used for scrubbing or other technologies are disproportionately located in marginalized communities. And these same communities are prime targets for new carbon capture technology as well. That has implications for how you store the carbon underground, but also transporting it. Compressed CO2 can result in asphyxiation in humans and animals, so if a pipeline had a leak or there was some other issue, that could pose a major problem. So even if this technology is a climate solution, it's still not fair to locate them disproportionately in marginalized communities. So where do we go from here? One key solution is, quite simply, to scale up carbon capture efforts. That's starting to happen, whether it be through private investments like Elon Musk's contest, or through public investments like the U.S. Department of Energy investing $8 million last year into algae-based carbon capture projects. All of these different types of carbon capture are deployed on relatively small scales currently. Obviously, scaling up would help the climate directly, but it also could help some of these technologies become more cost-effective, or iron out some of the other issues if you have more experts on the case. 
That said, there's only so much climate investment out there, public or private. And like we discussed, it's less than ideal if carbon capture is a trade-off with cheaper and more proven solutions, so it's worth considering what exactly that balance looks like. While on the topic of cost-effectiveness, it's also worth thinking about how we view the cost of carbon capture, as Columbia University's Dr. Julio Friedman explains. Whether or not it makes economic sense is up to us. We decide that. So there's additional cost to doing that, excellent. Does it make economic sense? That's up to us. If we had a, you know, $100 a ton green tariff for green steel, if we provided a production tax credit for steel the way that we do for electricity, we could pay for that. Okay, we don't do that today, but that's our decision, (laughs) right? I know Dr. Friedman's argument hinges on some substantial government intervention, so you may be reluctant to take him at his word. I mean, everything makes economic sense if you tax every alternative. How do you think Sonic the Hedgehog 2 plans to make money? But he is right that you can quantify the environmental benefit of capturing carbon. Better yet, you can quantify the environmental cost of that carbon remaining in the atmosphere. And what a government can do is turn that cost into a tax, or turn that benefit into a subsidy, or if they feel compelled to, create a regulation reflecting these values. You can even use carbon offset markets, though I am not opening that can of worms today, too much other stuff to cover. Either way, it can make sure the market reflects the true costs and benefits of carbon capture at a steel facility, like he says, at a power plant, what have you. So I wouldn't use Dr. Friedman's phrasing that we decide if it makes economic sense, because we can get cold, hard, objective numbers, but governments absolutely have the power to adjust our markets to reflect whatever those numbers tell us. More ideas to make the concentrated CO2 byproduct from carbon capture profitable could also be beneficial. Right now, the big one is that it creates material to help us drill fossil fuels, so that isn't giving off the best public image. It's like if Squeaky the Balloon Dinosaur were related to Joe Camel. But as I said, ideas like air vodka and air protein, creating cool stuff with algae, even a carbon-negative biofuel, might make people more aware and excited about carbon capture while bringing in some revenue for the industry. It's hard to see any of these examples scaling up considerably, but maybe they could, or maybe another idea has that potential. It's also worth considering ways to include more perspectives as carbon capture grows. We don't want to cite direct air capture facilities disproportionately in marginalized communities. We don't want to cut down a forest where indigenous people live for becks. There are many who feel carbon capture harms their communities, and since there are currently no specific federal laws regulating carbon capture technology, better regulation and closer monitoring might alleviate some of these concerns. These communities are also often pounding the table for clean energy, and focusing on that obviously has a lot of merits, but the use of carbon capture, if deployed thoughtfully, could be effective in tandem. And obviously, each individual strategy has kinks of its own to work out, and I'm sure we'll cover that more in the future. But ultimately, even if carbon capture isn't the answer... I'm optimistic that it can play a role in combating climate change. Because if it lives up to its full potential, we can reach net zero much sooner, become carbon negative someday, and capture so much carbon that Ariel can throw an LG Tupperware party. If anyone in the world were actually low on Tupperware, that would be pretty cool. hate fish but love the Boston Tea Party? If so, oil spills are for you. With oil spills, you can waste a whole bunch of potential fuel while simultaneously destroying marine ecosystems. Sounds like a win-win to me. Oil spills. Hey, at least BP got something right. 
The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. This story has been supported by the Solutions Journalism Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to rigorous and compelling reporting about responses to social problems. Learn more at solutionsjournalism.org. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Wake Smith, a lecturer at Yale University. Wake, welcome to the show. Very kind of you to have me, Ethan. You've just written a new book called Pandora's Toolbox, The Hopes and Hazards of Climate Intervention. Tell us a bit about the book and its message. The message broadly is that achieving net zero will not be the end of the climate problem, but likely just the end of the beginning of the climate problem. And even after net zero, there will be huge, uh, a huge overhang of climate issues that the world will still need to contend with. And the book explains why that is likely true and then what the sorts of interventions are that we might uh, undertake uh, to address that problem. So there's three climate solutions strategies, vaguely, mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering, which includes carbon capture as well as solar geoengineering. So if there comes a day where we've mitigated all of our carbon emissions, and we're just down to those final two, adaptation and geoengineering, do you feel like one supersedes the other? What do you feel like the roles of both of them would be in that, I guess, ideal future scenario? Well, I'm going to diversify the tool set a little bit. I would say there is mitigation or emissions reductions, and nothing that I will say today or write about in the book changes the fact that that's priority one. None of what I am discussing is an alternative to that. There's only one door, and we got to go through that door, and that door is emissions reductions or mitigation. There is some amount of climate change that we're going to have to live with, And adaptation, as you've rightly noted, is a set of ideas by which to do that, that range anywhere from buying another air conditioner to building seawalls across the Verrazano Narrows in, you know, to defend New York Harbor from sea level incursion, all sorts of uh, scales on which we can adapt. But if we reach net zero late, then those two things won't in combination be enough. Although to be clear, if we were to reach net zero by mid-century, as the IPCC would urge us to do, then we likely don't need much more. Likely mitigation and adaptation in combination would be sufficient. We would have preserved a livable climate, and that would be the end. One of the really popular carbon capture solutions seems to be bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BEX. And it seemed to me like the big issue is scaling with all of these trees taking up so much land. Do you feel like scaling is the main issue or do you feel like there are other concerns as well? Your observation is well said. Uh, Scaling is the problem. I actually love trees. I'm not trying to harm them. So I don't mean to uh, take the biological capture and storage techniques entirely off the table. But I do seek to puncture the naive hope that we can just solve the problem with a few trees and and, uh, organic farms. What we will instead need is an industry approximately the size of the entire fossil fuel industry today. So all the oil, all the natural gas, all the coal, that's how big an industry would be required to suck down and sequester underground carbon at the pace that we're now emitting it. That entire future industry would be set up at the same magnitude as the current fossil fuel industry, merely to undo the environmental harm that the fossil fuel industry is currently doing. So yeah, it would be a way better idea to stop doing that. Absolutely. And whether it be direct air capture or any of these other carbon capture and storage technologies, 
they're really expensive and that really poses a barrier. So how do you see any of these carbon solutions overcoming this hurdle? Is it policy? Is it developing the technology? What does that look like? It will be all of those things, policy and, and technology, but it's going to cost money. It's going to, it's going to a lot of money. Like, you know, the fossil fuel industry today is on, on the range of 5% of the entire global economy. And that's the size industry that we're talking about here that would be needed to remediate those wastes in the future. It will involve money. It will involve a big industrial complex all over the world. How we pay for that, how we get money from countries or people who are reluctant to help share that burden for the entire you know, benefit of the entire planet, both human and non-human. How we solve those governance problems, I don't know, but I'm afraid all of that is in our future. I'm curious if you could speak to where we put the carbon we capture. So you talk about putting it underground. I've heard some other smaller innovations like air vodka, air protein, Do you think that putting it underground actually does present a challenge? Because it seems like people are really worried about this, but everything I read seems to suggest that it's not too big a deal. So what say you? I am confident that putting it underground is the best place for it. There are lots of problems with that, but there's no alternative. The volume of carbon we're talking about is just beyond imagination anyway, not beyond measure, but it's just huge. There's nowhere else it could be put. And moreover, underground is where it all came from. You know, 200 years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, or 150 years ago, there was already carbon in the climate system, including in the atmosphere, but that was at a natural level and a stable level. What we've done since we uh, discovered fossil fuel energy, initially coal, is we've taken carbon that was safely buried in the Earth's crust and we put it into the air, and it's that excess carbon that is the problem. We can't put it all exactly back in the same place in the Earth's crust where it came from. We're not gonna put it back in a coal mine necessarily, in fact, period, but but there's nothing unnatural about it being in the Earth's crust. That's where it all came from, all the excess carbon. The most often discussed storage locations are saline aquifers, salty buried water. And the reason you would target saline aquifers is nobody's going to use that for drinking water or agriculture because it's salt water. So putting the carbon there would be a place that shouldn't disturb ecosystems much. Or disused oil and gas fields. After all, that's precisely where most of it came from or much of it came from. And you therefore know that you have rock that is capable of storing such stuff because it used to store it. Now, none of that is as easy as it sounds. There is the risk that some of this carbon that we newly pump underground returns to the surface. The most likely way it would return to the surface is that we bury it in a uh, spent oil field, but there are a whole bunch of penetrations into that oil field to drill oil 100 years ago or 10 years ago or whenever it was. And if we haven't abandoned properly each one of those wells, Each one of them becomes a conduit by which to have the stuff flow back up. So the storage solutions are themselves complicated and would require lots of ongoing management and monitoring to assure that the newly buried carbon doesn't return to the surface too quickly. But at least in theory, this ought to be doable. It's where the carbon came from. There's nothing, you know, problematical about the Earth's crust having carbon in it. And again, it's the only solution. The idea that we're going to turn it all into vodka or any product and drink it or make airplanes out of it or, you know, whatever, there is demand for perhaps 1% of the carbon that we currently produce. So we can solve 1% of the problem with carbon use. The other 99%, we need to sequester. So one of the issues I hear with geoengineering is this moral hazard problem, this for solar geoengineering and for carbon capture, where folks are concerned if we get too good at this, it would reduce world leaders' motivation to mitigate carbon emissions because there's this easy technological fix. 
To me, it actually motivates me even more to want to mitigate, knowing that we have all these tools in the toolbox. But where do you stand on this moral hazard problem? I think the moral hazard issue is vastly overestimated in terms of its importance. I don't see it as a very material issue. For starters, what we're talking about as the alternative is the idea of putting a bunch of aerosol particles into the sky. Does that sound like a great idea to you? The answer, of course, is no. It sounds scary. It sounds, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, everything. And so 20 years ago, perhaps when no one had heard about any of this, it might have been a plausible prediction to think that in the future, when the world does hear about this, people might think it sounds great and want to do it. Nobody reacts to it that way. That's just not a sensible prediction as to how the world will respond to this. So I don't think that there's a great likelihood that people will you know, love this idea and want to do it instead of mitigation. Moreover, if anyone is rash enough to see it that way, we should talk them out of it. You you can refer them to me. I'll tell them all about why this shouldn't be plan A. But you said that these things are happening more or less simultaneously, and that is not true. We must make huge progress on mitigation in my lifetime. And uh, uh, your viewers can't see, but my hair is white. We are not likely to commence solar geoengineering in my lifetime. Solar geoengineering, if we do it, is a mid-century or late-century intervention that we will only do if by then it's really hot and lots of people in the global south just can't stand it. But we're sure not going to do that anytime soon. Whereas mitigation, we need to be doing that right now and you know for years hereafter. So temporally, These things are also offset from each other. Mitigation is today's problem. Solar geoengineering, if we ever get to it, is a problem for a different generation. I'm sure you've answered this question already, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If there were one takeaway from Pandora's toolbox, either for policymakers or for the general public, what would that be? I need more than one, if I may, but we need, on the one hand, to accelerate research into carbon capture carbon storage, underground sequestration, and solar radiation management. We need to accelerate research on all of those things. We need to mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. But the one other thing that is sort of within the Pandora's toolbox set of solutions that we need to start doing immediately, not researching, but doing, is flue gas capture. Before we go out and capture carbon from the ambient air, we need to capture it from smokestacks, from fixed point emission sources. After all, the concentration of CO2 in a smokestack is like a thousand times that in ambient air. And if you wanna catch fish, you go where the fish are. So before we scale up direct air capture and sequestration technology, we need to scale up flue gas capture sequestration and technology. And that's something that is within our grasp. Technologically, uh, it's much less expensive and therefore more nearly in our grasp financially. And it's the thing within this solution set that we most urgently need to start doing. Wake, thank you so much for joining us. You're very kind to have me, Ethan. I appreciate it. This wraps up episode 79 of The Sweaty Penguin. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout-out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. You get merch, bonus content, and more. Clips today came from CNET Highlights, Rolling Stone, Inside Science, Grantham Research, and Climate Now. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET Group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.